Hello. Bob Moog once said, to be human, to be fully human, is to need music and derive nourishment from the music that you hear. What you do with our instruments helps us to be more human too. So what does it really mean to be human? And what is music anyway? Music gives us meaning in life. It resonates with us emotionally, moves us physically, and stimulates us intellectually. Music is central to social ritual. It brings people together and creates whole new communities. So to be human, to be fully human, is to explore and delight in all that music gives us access to. Alan Strange in his book, Electronic Music, Systems, Techniques, and Controls, once said, try everything. Never wonder, should I do this? But instead adopt an attitude of, I wonder what will happen if. In this series, we're gonna cover a wide range of topics about synthesizers and music. How do synthesizers work? How do different circuits work? And how would you wanna use them musically? But more than anything, let's cultivate a desire to explore sound. Having a better understanding of how things work can often unlock new avenues for exploration, but it can just as often lead us to play like a robot, resorting to tried and true methods without ever really exploring everything that an instrument can do. So let's combine an understanding of synthesizers with that adventurer's spirit, knowing that there's always a new sound around the corner, and that to be human is to play like a child in search of those new sounds. The first commercially available devices we recognize as a synthesizer today were invented by Bob Moog in 1964. Like any good engineer, Bob embraced the principle of modularity in the design of his synthesizer. Electronic devices such as oscillators, filters, and amplifiers had existed as laboratory test equipment previously, and experimental musicians had begun integrating them into their compositions. Yet they had never been arranged into a single electronic instrument before. How many oscillators, for example, would a musician want in such an instrument? Because this was a radical idea and there were no previous examples to rely on, modules were kept separate so that each musician could arrange as many of them together in whichever configuration they saw fit. Each configuration was called a patch and effectively created a new instrument. This modular design was pushed even further by Bob and composer Herb Deutsch's invention of voltage control, which was presented in the 1964 AES paper Voltage Controlled Electronic Music Modules. Their insight was to use voltage to control parameters of these different modules, say the frequency of an oscillator or the volume of an amplifier, which allowed you to play them musically. Let's try to make some music with electronic circuits. I can turn the volume of an amplifier up and down to create distinct notes, and I can turn the frequency control of an oscillator to change pitch. But that's not a very nice playing experience, is it? It requires coordination that would prevent most people from ever playing it as an instrument. Plus, I only have two hands. What if I want to change many parameters at once? Bob's principle of voltage control essentially allows us to use voltage to control these knobs for us. When I go to play the piano, I make two decisions. First, I decide which note to play by choosing which key I press, say a C or an E flat. And then I decide which time the note is gonna play by deciding when I'm gonna press and hold the key down. A keyboard takes these decisions you make and translates them into control voltages. When I play a note on the keyboard, a precise tuned voltage is sent to the oscillators to tune them to the correct pitch. So that whatever pitch I play on the keyboard, the voltage updates the oscillators to the correct pitch. The keyboard also sends what's called a gate signal, which is at zero volts while no keys are being pressed down. When I press a key, the gate voltage jumps to a high state and it stays high for as long as I have a key held down. When I release the key, the gate signal goes down 
to zero volts, and then we'll go back up again when I press a new key. Everything in the synthesizer communicates through the language of voltage. These two ideas, modular design and voltage control, were the key insights behind the earliest synthesizers. Over the years, Bob watched musicians using his big modular systems, and he noticed that certain patches emerged, certain trends emerged, where musicians could basically have a single patch setup that they would never have to change, but would give them a lot of sonic flexibility. Bob and his team realized that they could take advantage of these common patches and offer a smaller and portable system, which would take a handful of modules and hardwire this patch configuration together, giving musicians a wide range of sounds, but in the context of a fluid and expressive musical instrument. Thus, the Mini Moog Model D was born and gave birth to the synthesizer as we know it today. Like its modular bigger brother, the Mini Moog is still a collection of modular electronic circuits, all communicating together through the common language of voltage. The legacy of the Mini Moog continues in the Moog Messenger, which, like the Mini Moog, is a collection of modules which speak to each other through the common language of voltage. On the Messenger, we have a digital brain which can take snapshots of panel settings for recall later. Now we understand a bit more about how a synthesizer works, but how exactly does a synthesizer create sound? And what is sound anyway? Well, sound is a pressure wave in the air. Certain regions of the air are more densely packed with the air molecules closer together and at a higher pressure, whereas other regions in the air are more loosely packed with the air molecules further apart and at a lower pressure. If we think of this sound wave as a plot of sound pressure over time, we can see that the higher values correspond to denser pockets of air, whereas the lower values correspond to more loosely packed regions of air. With a speaker, we can use voltage to create sound in the air. Applying a positive voltage moves the speaker cone out and creates a higher pressure level, whereas using a negative voltage pulls the speaker cone in creating a lower pressure region. By moving the speaker cone out and in, we create sound in the air, with the speaker cone at rest corresponding to zero volts, positive and negative voltages creating sound signals. This zero volt reference point when the speaker is at rest is important. Audio signals use positive and negative voltage to go around the zero volt rest point because the speaker cone wants to stay at rest. If it's being pushed too much in one direction or the other, that can cause strain on the speaker and it might begin to wear out. The speaker is what's called a transducer. A transducer basically just translates an electrical signal in voltage into an acoustic wave in the air. Transducers can also work the other way around, translating acoustic signals into electrical ones. A microphone is a transducer. When an air pressure wave hits the microphone capsule, it sets the magnet of a microphone vibrating, positive and negative, inducing a current which is then converted into a voltage and sent off to be recorded onto tape or a digital recorder. Transducers are vibrating membranes that translate signals from the electrical domain into the acoustic domain and vice versa. Analog synthesizers are called analog because they generate the analog in voltage to the signal we want to create in the air.
Now that we have a better understanding of how voltages and transducers work, let's take a look at how the ear works. If we have a better grasp at how signals interact with our ear and how our brain perceives those signals, then we can better understand how to manipulate our brains by creating textures in the ear. The eardrum is a transducer, just like the microphone we described earlier. When sound in the air hits our eardrum, it sets it vibrating, which in turn moves three little bones in the middle ear, which transduce that signal into a fluid in our inner ear. The eardrum transduces the sound in the air into a sound in a liquid. Waves in the fluid of the inner ear then travel down into the cochlea, which is a snail-shaped organ full of tiny little hairs. Each of these hairs is tuned to a resonant frequency and vibrates in sympathy with the waves passing over them. Each hair picks up the signal in its frequency band and transduces that into an electrical signal. Those electrical signals are then sent via nerves into the oral cortex of the brain. These hairs in the cochlea function as what are called bandpass filters. We'll talk all about bandpass filters later in this course, but for now all you need to know is that a bandpass filter lets through a certain range of frequencies and filters out all the rest. They're called the critical bands. There are 24 of them, and they span the range of human hearing, from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. This is the range of frequencies that can be picked up by our eardrum and transduced into signals in the liquid in our inner ear, and the range of frequencies which can be picked up by the bandpass filters in the cochlea and directly converted into electrical signals that get sent to our brains. But while that's the range of frequencies directly interpretable by our auditory system, it doesn't quite cover the range of frequencies that we can perceive. This oscillator control controls the frequency of pitch in the auditory range, but watch what happens when I turn it to low frequencies. The tone breaks up. We start hearing rhythm rather than pitch. We started with a saw wave in the auditory range, but as we cross that lower threshold of 20 hertz, we stop perceiving a steady tone and start perceiving a rhythmic series of pulses and clicks. If we take this same wave and start reducing the frequency even more to where it starts to take 20 or 30 seconds to repeat, we start to approach timescales in the realm of form and structure, where one click may indicate the beginning of one section of a song, and the next click indicates the beginning of the next section of the song. Or we can go in the other way, to really, really high frequencies, frequencies that are associated with AM and FM radio transmission. These frequencies are in the megahertz range, and we can't hear them directly, but we can play with them on the synthesizer. So the range of human hearing is actually a very small subset of the much wider range of human perception of sound in time. When we play with music, we're playing with time. And while it may be tempting to limit what we do with the synthesizer to the range of human hearing, to the realm of pitch, let's take a wider look for a moment. Sure, we can use an oscillator to create a pitched note, but we can also lower the range of that oscillator to create rhythm, and we can lower it further to create form and structure. All of these concepts are mutable, just different ways of perceiving repeating patterns in time. Synthesizers are instruments, but they're also open-ended playgrounds. In the rest of this series, we're gonna dive deep into each part of the synthesizer understanding what it does, and how you can use it to make music. But as we go, let's never lose that adventurer's spirit, using the synthesizer to explore our perception of time. Mm -hmm.